Welcome everyone to the Bible study as we finish up our 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. It's very, very uh, exciting uh, to spend another week uh, with each other growing in the Lord and preparing ourselves to encounter Him in the Word and in the Sacrament at Holy Mass uh, on Sunday. A beautiful gift, beautiful gift. All right, let's 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 get right into our, our reading. Well, let's, let's pray. Let's, we should do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, maybe today we, we call to mind someone in our lives who uh, needs to be touched, who would benefit from being touched by God's grace. Uh, we just call that person to mind and whatever they've got going on in their life, uh, some suffering maybe, maybe they've fallen away from the Lord, um, they're resisting the gospel maybe, uh, we have a broken relationship with them maybe, whatever it is, call that person to mind and just give that person over to Jesus. And Lord, we ask you to, to bring healing, to bring blessing, to bring conversion, what, whatever it may be, Lord, that these people need. Uh, draw them into the mystery of your divine love. We pray this in your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let's get into So our reading today, uh, we're finishing up. We've been in 2 Thessalonians now last the last two weeks, and now this week we're finishing up 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 3. And our reading officially is verses 7 through 12, chapter 3, 7 through 12. But what I propose we do and what we're going to do, it's not that I propose it, we're actually going to do is, is read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 16. In my Bible, my New American Bible that I've got here, um, the, the whole 6 through 16 is one chunk of, of reading, of a passage. Uh, our reading that we have is within that, of course. Um, but I, I would just want to look at the whole thing here. So with that, let's, let's get into it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 16. St. Paul says, We instruct you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to shun any brother who conducts himself in a disorderly way, and not according to the tradition they received from us. For you know how one must imitate us. For we did not act in a disorderly way among you, nor did we eat food received free from anyone. On the contrary, in toil and drudgery, night and day, we worked, so as not to burden any of you. Not that we do not have the right, rather we wanted to present ourselves as a model for you, so that you might imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, we instructed you that if anyone was unwilling to work, neither should that one eat. We hear that some are conducting themselves among you in a disorderly way, by not keeping busy but minding the business of others. Such people we instruct and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and to eat their own food. But you, brothers, do not be remiss in doing good. If anyone does not obey our word as expressed in this letter, take note of that person, not to associate with him, that he may be put to shame. Do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Okay, so maybe, maybe you remember this. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the, the first reading that we had from 2 Thessalonians, um, that <clears throat> Paul has heard about the Thessalonians. Well, so let's, let's go back even further, actually. We know from the Acts of the Apostles that Paul was in Thessalonica for three Sabbaths. So three weekends was, was really all that he was able to be there for. So it would be like if, if uh, your, your priest or your, yeah, your pastor came in and he was with you for three weeks and then he was chased out of town. Because that's, that's what happened to Paul. He was there for three weeks. He, he, he got a bunch of converts, but then the, the other people, the, the Jewish leaders, they didn't like what he was doing. And so they chased him out of town. So Paul had to flee like in the middle of the night. So that's all the time he got to be with them. Then he heard, or, or he was wondering, how did, how did it go with them? Like, did they really catch the gospel? And this we read about in 1 Thessalonians, that he sent Timothy to go find out how it went and bring a report back. And he writes to the Thessalonians saying, and it's even better than I thought it could have been. I'm, I'm so delighted. I'm so proud of you as a father that, that you, you caught the gospel and, and you're, you're living it. And, and now I just want to encourage you to keep living it. Now he's writing 2 Thessalonians. And Paul has, has heard about some things that are going on in Thessalonica. And it's not all it's not all great this time. I mean, there's still some good things, right? It's, so he's not, it, the whole thing isn't like, you know, you're, you're terrible people. In fact, he begins the letter by giving thanks. Absolutely. But but there's still some things that need to be corrected because it, it, it seems Paul has heard uh, that it seems like people either sent a letter or they sent a messenger saying that they were from Paul, but then they started preaching in a way 
that's different from what Paul preaches. And not just in a way, but they started preaching things, uh, uh, realities, supposed realities, that Paul was not preaching. They started talking about how the second coming of Jesus, which we believe as Christians, Jesus is going to come again to judge the living and the dead, as we profess in our creed every week. Uh, these people started preaching or teaching in their letter that Jesus had already come. And so the people who are reading the letter missed out on the second coming. Um, or or it's, it's either that or that the, the second coming is happening like tomorrow. So that's, that's what Paul is hearing is going on. And so now Paul, a big part of this letter is to sort of correct that. To say, we, di we didn't say that. And if anyone comes and preaches to you by word or by letter, something contrary to what you received from us, don't believe that person. Don't, don't buy into it. And, and so now Paul, as he's wrapping up this letter, he's, he's making note of this, that people who have heard that the second coming of Jesus either already happened or that it's imminent, that is to say that it's happening very, very soon, people who, who heard this and believed it, they, they did, I guess, what anyone would do if, if they thought that Jesus was coming tomorrow. They, they quit their jobs. Uh, they, they're no longer working either for the kingdom or in any real way. And they're just sort of like, they're just sort of sitting back and waiting. And, and, and Paul is saying, don't do that. In fact, we need to, we need to set up good order among your community. And, and so what you should do actually is if you're encountering people who are being stubborn in that, uh, in, in just refusing to, to believe anything other than this false message, then you should actually, you should, you should do what? You should shun that brother. And I, I love, I love at the end here, uh, in, in verse uh, 15, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother, right? So, so if anyone doesn't obey our word as expressed in this letter, right? So not in the false letters, not in the false messages, but in this letter that, that I, Paul, am writing, if anyone doesn't obey our word, take note of him and not don't associate with him so that he may experience the shame of being set apart from the community of Christians. Not that you're treating him like an enemy, but you're admonishing him because this is something that we as Christians ought to do is admonish each other, to correct each other if we see each other acting in disorderly ways, in ways that are not set up according to the order of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the way of the Christian life. So that's that's a really good thing. So Paul, Paul now says what? For you know how one must imitate us. For we did not act in a disorderly way among you, nor did we eat food received free from anyone. On the contrary, in toil and drudgery, night and day, we worked so as not to burden any of you. We know this, again, from the Acts of the Apostles. We know that Paul, when he would go into towns, of course he would preach, especially on, on the Sabbath, on, on, uh, in the synagogues and other places of worship, he would, he would go and preach. But we also know that alongside of his preaching, he would set up shop and he would be a tent maker. So he, he worked. And uh, why did he work? He worked so that through his working, he could have income so that he wouldn't have to get income from the people who were believing in him. Even though he says in, in verse 9, not that we do not have the right. right? And we know this, that in Jesus, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus, when he's sending out his disciples, for example, in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, he sends out his disciples and he tells them, uh, eat what is set before you for the laborer deserves his wages. So Jesus himself is setting a precedent, uh, setting the standard that, that those who preach the gospel of, of Jesus, they, they actually have a right to receive from the people that they're preaching for. But Paul says, well, we, we have that right, but rather we wanted to present ourselves as a model for you so that you might imitate us. Paul is saying, we, we had you in mind because, uh, I mean, who knows? Who knows why he had them in mind? But in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, these are this whole Christianity thing is new. And we want to set up an example for people who, they're, they're giving their lives over to Jesus, but they also have to, they have to keep on living. You know, they have to, they have to earn, earn the food that they eat. They have to earn money so that they can get the food that they eat. So we, we, should, we should be a model for them of, of what that looks like. So I think that that's really probably what was in Paul's mind is, is we want to show people that not everyone can, can do what we're doing, which is to go and, and preach and, and just only preach and, and, and only serve the gospel. But we need people, uh, most people, in fact, need to be living their lives while they're also serving the gospel. And so this is the model that we're going to lay out for them. So I, I think that's, that's what's going on here. Um, 
And in fact, he went so far as to say this, right, in verse 10. In fact, when we were with you, we instructed you that if anyone was unwilling to work, neither should that one eat. Right? And now Paul is, is saying that, that we're actually hearing that people are going against what we taught you. And I, I think about this. I think, so Paul was only with them for three, three Sabbaths. So he only got to preach to them really three times as a community. And this must have been something that he preached to them, either as a community or, or during the week when people would come to visit him in his tent making shop, uh, that this was, this was something that was important to him to, to teach them a properly ordered life as a Christian. Um, so I think, I think there's a very practical thing here that, that we should never just simply believe that the, the coming of Jesus is imminent. And so therefore we should, we should quit working, uh, so there's that, but then there's also maybe the, the bigger principle to draw out of this, which is that as Christians, as Catholic Christians, we want to live well-ordered lives and we want our communities to be ordered well. So I, I think to take the bigger principle here and say this, this, this letter, this reading is, is really in some ways about so much more than whether the people are working or not working. It is about that, absolutely. But it's also about this reality that, that Paul always has in mind and that you and I maybe should always have in mind that we want, overall, we want to will, live well-ordered lives, both individually and as communities. And so I think it's, it's worth maybe reflecting on, is my life a life that is well-ordered? And is the community that I'm living in, the Christian community that I'm living in, is it a, a, a community that's well ordered. And if it's not, if there are people that I see in my life or in my community or myself that are not living well ordered lives, then maybe I actually need to be admonished or I need to admonish somebody. Always in charity, you know, of course. Not not as an enemy, but as a brother. As a brother who I, I have real concern about for for his or her salvation. And and so I go to them and I encourage them, challenge them maybe to live a well ordered life. Just like I would hope that somebody would do the same for me if they saw that I was living in a disorderly way. Um, and and I, I think so in verse 12, so this would be the end of our reading, the last verse, right? Such people we instruct and urge in the Lord Jesus to work quietly and to eat their own food. Those who are, those who are, are refusing to work, we urge them to work quietly and to eat their own food. To not make a big fuss about, about you know, their, their false beliefs, but instead to just Live a quiet life, a simple life. But but you, he says, you who are receiving this, you who maybe are the ones who are able to go and admonish your brothers, do not be remiss in doing good. Right. So so th there's this reality that some people in our communities are living disordered lives, and and so we want to actually help them come to a place of living in well ordered manner. But for us, maybe who are already striving to live in a well ordered manner, what does Paul say? Well, for you. Never be remiss in doing good. In other words, always look for ways to, to serve the people around you, just as I, Paul, did, and, and Timothy, and, and those who were with him. Uh, we, we saw the order of the gospel. We saw the goodness of God. And so that led us to, to strive to do good works for, for other people, to serve them out of love for Christ, so that maybe they can see, uh, you know, it's like the, the model, the imitation can go to the next generation, that maybe they can see uh, what it looks like to live the gospel in its fullness, um, which can then maybe inspire them and, and help them to encounter the grace of God. So I think, I think that's the reading here. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a good one, both for the very practical and, and, you know, single issue that Paul is talking about, but then also for the principle that we can draw from it uh, to lead uh, more well-ordered lives. All right. God bless you.